What's up, guys? It's Raynad back once again with another update video for The Bazaar. And it's going to be a pretty big one. So, first of all, we're getting right up to that point where we're about to hire a bunch of people uh, onto the project and really start moving it forward a lot more quickly. Uh, I'm really eager to do that because as soon as we do, uh, you guys are going to start seeing updates a lot more frequently. Things are going to start changing much more quickly. Uh, right now, I've been working with a really small team. Um, and I'm excited to finally be able to grow it. First of all, I'm going to just kind of jump into it and talk about, I guess, the stuff that changed since the last update video. So we really, you know, dove into the design process and started making a lot of progress uh, when it comes to actual game design, card design, mechanics, and uh, we still haven't even begun to scratch the surface on what we can do with the game. So uh, I'm really excited because, you know, I think like for a game like Hearthstone, one of my big issues as a player is that there is so little design space to play with, and it meant that every time they release an expansion, and a lot of the mechanics were just versions of cards that used to exist in the game with some different numbers, maybe in a different class. And, you know, I feel like, you know, the Bazaar, even though, uh, you know, it is a fairly simple game, simple UI, you know, there's even less going on than in Hearthstone. We still have just a ton of room for different types of mechanics and, and play styles. So what we have been playing with up until this point has just been Wizard. All we had was wizard cards. We started with one class. And, um, you know, came to the realization that it's pretty much impossible to design a class in a vacuum and then move on to the next one. You really need to balance multiple classes simultaneously and see how they interact and test different play styles. So what we ended up doing is building out small libraries of cards for five different classes. And I'm just going to kind of show you guys the game client because, you know, unlike previous videos, I don't really have new art or anything like that to show you guys. Uh, instead, I'm going to show things that we changed in the game uh, physically. So first of all, I guess, uh, let me actually back out of this. What I will play for you is a banger. Let's actually start with some music. So I've been talking to a lot of musicians uh, because I've been anticipating, you know, getting to that point where we're going to hire more people. And um, I've found a lot of different musicians that specialize in different things. And I'm starting to kind of hone in on what it is that we want for the game. Um, and there's a lot more that goes into the music design uh, than I thought. That's something that I'll make a separate video on down the line uh, once we actually have some finalized pieces to show you guys. But uh, here in the early stages, um, I have been talking to a lot of people about it. A lot of my, my uh, close friends, have, uh, they actually you know, are musicians. They're really excited to be a part of the project. Uh, Jeff Leach is not a musician. He's excited to voice act a bunch of characters. I can't wait to have him do that. My good friend Ryan Paul, uh, Wax Wayne Music on Twitch underscore wax Wayne on Twitter actually uh, sent me over a bunch of samples, just music that he wrote for the game because uh, he was excited about the project and the idea. And we, we had some back and forth and I told him about, you know, a lot of game music that I like. For example, my favorite song in any video game ever is Gerudo Valley from Ocarina of Time. And um, he really took inspiration from that and he made this uh, two minute song, which I'm just going to play in its entirety because it's a fucking banger and I'm a fan of it. This probably is a little bit too exciting to be background music during the game but maybe for like a title screen something like this could be a really good fit so i'll just kind of play this for you guys see what you think and i highly recommend if you want to check out some amazing music streamers on twitch go ahead and start with wax wayne here's the the song that he wrote it's called welcome to the bazaar
All right, there you go. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty cool piece. Anyway, I'm not going to play background music in the gameplay that I show you guys, just in case it's not something we composed. I'm not actually sure where we got the background music. I don't want to get copyright striked for it. Moving on. I'm just going to jump into a game, kind of show you guys some of the stuff that we've been working on developing. So by the way, I love like the spacey sound in the back of Welcome to the Bazaar, that song that I played. It's kind of like a Rick and Morty meets Gerudo Valley thing. Uh, it's kind of cool. So one of the big things that we started by doing is building out these small card pools for every class so that we can start testing multiple classes together. Um, and I kind of gave the designers autonomy and what kind of class they wanted to build. I, I didn't say make an engineer or make a chef. I said just, you know, make a class that comes to you naturally uh, as a good starting point. So on these hero portraits, these names, the wizard, werewolf, and merchant are all accurate, but the chef and engineer, they're playable, but they're other classes. So engineer is actually an archaeologist, and the chef is a summoner class. It's very likely that we'll end up, you know, with wizard, werewolf, chef, engineer, merchant when we launch, but... The idea, keep in mind, is that this game monetizes like League of Legends. So we constantly want to be releasing new classes, and we want to make sure that as we release new classes, every class is a very different play style. So right now what we're doing is testing a bunch of different play styles, a bunch of different classes. Maybe we'll launch with a different five than we originally planned. I don't know yet. It's still pretty early stage. Uh, but for now, it's playable. All right, so we're going to play as Merchant against the Wizard. And uh, yeah, I'll just kind of talk about some of the changes that we made, and hopefully you guys will see that in the build. So keep in mind, all these graphics subject to change. We don't plan on using these graphics for uh, anything in the actual game. It's all sketches. It's all placeholder stuff. The game won't actually look anything like this, but the location of stuff is probably close to what it will be. Um, anyway, uh, one big focus of ours uh, that we've been uh, well focusing on, I guess is the word, um, is game time. So right now, one of the big uh, priorities has been, let's figure out how we take the bazaar and get it down to like 15 minute games, right? This is something that is really tough for deck building games to do because in almost every other deck building game, you have much longer game time. Uh, you're going to be uh, playing the game for just, I don't know, an incredibly long amount of time, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 20 at the shortest if it's something like Star Realms. Um, and, you know, it's something that we wanted to uh, address. So what we've been thinking about are lots of little ways that we can start um, shaving away uh, at game time. So right now, one of the things that the game cannot do that I wish it could is uh, queue up targeting effects. So for example, uh, if you're already in the process of attacking with something, you can't queue up a second thing that targets. Um, and that's something that I think uh, being able to queue up multiple attacks it should be a fairly high priority just because, uh, you know, that's what's going to enable us to... Um... Sorry, one sec. It's really hard to talk about the game and play at the same time. Um, I won't do a whole game. I'll just uh, talk about stuff that's important. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, being able to queue up multiple attacks is, I think, a step that we're going to take. Uh, one thing that, that we're working on doing, for example, uh, if you pay attention to like the sun up here in the uh, top left. Um, this is to denote whether it's the day or the night. Uh, and that day-night cycle is going to be a really big element of the game, right? When, when it switches between day and night, the background music will change. The visuals should change. Uh, at night, new neutral monsters show up, replacing the old ones. At day, beginning of a new day, uh, the stores refresh. So every store card that's not some sort of token... Uh, will get completely replaced. And this is really important because, you know, in a traditional deck building game, both players are buying from the same center, uh, central pile of stores. The big thing that the Bazaar does differently from other deck building games, besides all the digital stuff, is that we have unique stores for every class. So I'm the only one buying from these stores. My opponent's the only one buying from those. And what happens is you don't want the stores to clog up and force a player to buy cards that don't fit his deck just to get to the card under it. This is a problem that I described in one of my earlier update videos, uh, which is, you know, we want card velocity to be a thing. So uh, what we've done here is um, made sure that at the beginning of a new day, all the stores refresh. That's why we have that rule. So anyway, I'm going to end the turn. We're going to go over to the, the wizard's turn. So you can see how the screen got darker now. I mean, this is, this is like super ugly. It's just placeholder. But we're starting to incorporate at least ugly versions of these like little feedback mechanisms, right? So now 
when it goes to nighttime, you'll see the board get darker. Uh, we're probably, when we actually do like the proper 3D modeling and everything for the game board, uh, we will have, you know, we'll probably have two versions of the game board for people to look at. So for now, for example, I can show you guys like, so when we have like the proper uh, game board that's all 3D rendered and vibrant and colorful, we'll probably have like two versions of it, you know, for nighttime, daytime. Possibly we're going to have a three stage day so that it alternates who's which player gets nighttime first, which player gets daytime first. If we end up doing the three stage thing, then we might have three stages of lighting, but that's just a, you know, a visual mechanism that we're thinking of. So I'm just gonna uh, speed through this turn, buy some, uh, some stuff. Whoops, excuse me. It's not our turn, it's the wizard's turn. So let's see, we're gonna kill some bees, draw some cards, make some money, cast some spells. Um, one other thing that we, we've really started to work on, and this is honestly, this is something I want your guys' feedback on. Um, if you don't already know what the cards do, the game's like impossible to follow. But I think this is true of like every card game in existence. The first time you watch Hearthstone, if you, don't, if you haven't played with the cards yourself yet, you're not going to know what all the stuff on the board is and what all the cards do. So in our game, we're really trying to figure out what the best way to communicate the information of new cards is. For a stream, you know, we're going to have like Twitch extensions and all this stuff that makes it easy for the viewer to follow what's going on. You know, you'll be able to like click on the deck, click on the discard pile, see what's in both, follow what the players are building. But for cards on the board, we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to show um, what the player, like what the cards do. So right now, uh, for example, we're putting a lot of focus into the tooltip because the tooltip at the end of the day is the number one way that um, players get new information about uh, what their deck does, uh, what the cards in front of them do. So the tooltip has to be really excellent for this game. And, you know, at first we started by um, looking at a bunch of... Um, I wrapped up that turn. So at first what we did is we started looking at a bunch of ways, a bunch of rules that could apply to every card in the game. For example, there's a lot of cards in the game that generate other cards, like uh, Quarry Acquisition here. Here we already see a tooltip bug. It's a car, it's a spell. I, I cast the spell and it gives me a bunch of stuff. Copper coins, silver coins, stones, gems. It just adds a bunch of crap to my deck, right? And uh, here, I'll buy it so you guys can see. And uh, you see all these cards added to my deck. And when I buy it, it's a spell. That's, uh, we gotta get the spells and the items and everything don't look different yet. Anyway. What's really important is nailing this tooltip. Long story short, that's what I'm ranting about. We want to make sure this tooltip is excellent. We want to make sure that it conveys the information it needs to quickly and understandably. What we did before is, if you look at like the old video, like a gameplay video that I posted, networking build video, you can just like hover over stuff and see something right away. But what, what I did here is, uh, what I suggested we did in this build is blur out everything in the background when you're hovering over a tooltip. This way, if it's a multi-stage card that generates other cards, like this fire potion, it's clear that, like, what you should be looking at, right? I hover over Minotaur Horn. It has, okay, it has a pile of text. Excuse me for how complicated this card is. Part of the tooltip's broken and all that, obviously. Anyway, you look at Minotaur Horn, you see the card that it generates, right? So we're getting closer to a workable tooltip. Uh, all these little touches, like graying out the background, are going to be pretty important things moving forward. And uh, honestly, this is going to be, like, half of what the game development is going to be, is figuring out all these, like, little things we can do to make the game easier to follow, to make the game a little bit faster. One of the big things we're focusing on, like I said, is speed. And we're noticing a lot of problems with the existing card design. We're going to have to change that card design to make the, the speed uh, just, a, just a better pace for the game. So right now, first of all, I think a lot of the animations are too slow. I think it's really slowing the game down that you can't queue up multiple actions, or mul you can't queue up multiple attacks on different targets, rather. You can queue up multiple purchases. We're going to be looking at lots of little things we can do to speed the game up, but the biggest one, or one of the biggest, is, uh, well, besides, like, actually changing the turn timer to one minute, uh, is, the, is the card design itself. A lot of the cards in the game right now draw a bunch of cards. And my thinking when I started designing cards in this game is that, well, drawing a bunch of cards is fun. Every card game player loves drawing a bunch of cards. Drawing cards is awesome. You can just um, draw 20 cards in a turn and everyone will be happy, right? Every deck is comboing off. And the reality is, like, in practice, um, it actually slows the game down a lot. Because when you have a bunch of cantrips and everybody's playing what's effectively a storm deck, uh, you end up having... 
uh, you know, a lot of these situations where, sorry, I'm going to buy crystal and amulet there. You end up having a lot of these situations where each player after turn six is drawing like 20 cards a turn. And it really slows the game down because, you know, both players are spending this whole turn cycling through their deck and looting and all this stuff. And that's awesome. Everybody feels like they're playing a combo deck. The problem is a lot of times it, it results in having like 20 minute games and we're trying to shave that down. So what I think we're going to start doing is, you know, removing or reworking a lot of cantrips in the game. For example, this Mystic, right? Gain a, gain a gold, draw a card. Um, this is like the type of mechanic that it doesn't seem like a big deal, right? You play it, you draw a card, whatever. It's one second of an animation. But when you end up having so many cards in the game with this type of mechanic, it really does slow it down. And if we were to really cut down on the number of cantrips and really focus on having... Uh, unique effects that are just like standalone doing powerful things uh, we would actually end up with a um, uh, just a much more um, faster game so it's not about removing decision making or anything it's just about prioritizing card design that's a little bit faster right and that's something that we're going to work on this mortar and pestle card that the wizard just played for example adds a random potion to his hand he plays the card animation happens adds a potion the potion gets played, animation happens, cleansing a card from his deck, drawing a card. You know, when you do a lot of those things in one turn, it really does add up. We're trying to shave those down. Um, we're still thinking of other ways that we can make the game faster. I think, like like I said, the obvious ones are going to be just lowering this turn timer down to, you know, something closer to a minute. I'll probably do, like, a scaling turn timer so the early turns will have maybe, like, 30 seconds or 40 seconds. And then, you know, the amount of time you have per turn will scale up as the game progresses up to a maximum of, let's say, like 90 seconds or something. Uh, we'll try something like that. I believe this is the first build where we have a proper rope. So I'm actually going to let the turn timer run down uh, and see if that's true. I want to see if the rope is in effect here. But I'm just going to send all of these uh, things at his face because I am uh, living scum. And that's how you play children's card games. I eh, could buy a potion. Let's buy a potion. And get a golden potion. Hit him for another five. He got bopped. All right, anyway, let's let this timer run down, see if the rope is still there. We're just constantly thinking about ways we can change the card design to make it faster. So this means that, for example, like the archaeologist class, which used to, still does, has a lot of looting effects. Effects where you draw a card and then discard a card. Those kinds of effects are great, right? They have synergy with discard pile. Flavorfully, it makes sense for an archaeologist who's digging stuff up. The problem you run into is when you have a bunch of looting effects in one deck, it slows the game down. Because a looting effect is like four times slower than just a draw effect. You draw the card, then you have to look at your entire hand and pick which card to discard manually. Um, it takes a very long time to do. So... Uh, you know, it might be the case that we even mess around with some mechanics like discard at random rather than manually. And you can see some of the things that we've done from the onset have tried to speed the game up. Like the cleansing potion that I played earlier. Cleansing means remove a bad card from your deck. Now in a normal deck building game, you pick that card manually. You pick the card that banishes a card from your deck or scraps a card from your deck, whatever they call it in that game. Look through a whole pile, pick a card out. This game we automate it. Every, every bad card has a cleanse priority, and it's just an automatic action. So here we do have a rope, finally. Feels good, man. Does it blow up, too? Hey, nice. All right, cool. I was getting really frustrated before we had the rope because I wouldn't pay attention to this timer in the corner, and I would be thinking about my turn, and then suddenly all my cards would get discarded, and the, the turn would pass over. So I know it seems like an obvious thing. We were, we were always going to have a rope, but the fact that it's finally in there is a... It's a pretty big deal to me. I was definitely losing some games to that before. I mean, you know, if anyone asks, I've never lost a game, but, you know, it's hypothetically possible if you skip turns. So one of the really big things that we did to try to reduce game time is we changed when cards are drawn. So what used to happen is when you finish your turn, every card in your hand gets discarded. And then in the beginning of your turn, you draw five cards. And this is how every deck building game usually worked. Beginning of the turn, you draw your five that you're going to use. End of the turn, you discard anything that you didn't use. And what we realized is, in a turn-based game like this, if you don't see your next hand until the beginning of your turn, then you don't get to start planning your turn ahead. So 
your opponent is doing all this stuff and you would have no cards in hand and you couldn't even really plan ahead for your next turn very much. So what we did is, you guys will see right here when I end the turn, we made the player draw four cards. Now originally the instinct was to do five cards, right? You, you draw five cards at the end rather than five cards at the beginning. But I realized this might, right now it's not too bad, but down the line this might result in a problem where, for example, let's say you draw your five cards and they're bad. You know that your next turn is going to be weak. And you watch your opponent sit there and, and, and play with himself for two minutes having a great turn. And you just know that no matter what happens, you're going to have a weak turn. And uh, this is a really like bad feeling, right? It's something I wanted to avoid. On top of that, one great thing about drawing one card per turn is that you have this big top deck moment, right? Sometimes there's going to be a scenario where you need to draw a specific card in order to win the game. And if you're my opponent, you're going to hit that scenario 110% of the time. And that's a really flashy moment that makes the game more fun to watch and more fun to play. So in order to have top deck moments, what I suggest that we start with is a 4-1 split. Where at the end of the turn, you draw four cards. Beginning of the turn, you draw one card. And we're going to see, you know, in practice how this plays out and whether it's, uh, you know, actually better or not. But um, you'll see here at the beginning of my turn, I draw the fifth card, right? So again, still playing with five cards per turn, but now instead of drawing five at the beginning only, now instead we draw four at the end, one at the beginning. And I'll see if this is the right kind of split down the line. I'm not 100% sure yet. It might just make more sense to do five cards at the end of the turn, but I wanted to explain this to you guys because um, this really sped the game up a lot even though it didn't change animation speeds or anything, just by giving the player time to think during his opponent's turn and plan ahead what he's going to do with his cards that he has. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Anyway, yeah, I like how it's, how it's moving along. Uh, some other gameplay mechanics that we've incorporated that we haven't really leveraged yet are status effects. So for example, in order to have counterplay with your opponent, you can put bad cards in their deck. You can put bad cards to cover up their stores. And for example, this stun, this is a bad card. Uh, if I draw it that turn, uh, I can't attack with weapons. This card is super fucking toxic. It's getting reworked. But the point is, because I have this curse in my deck, I have this status effect on me that just says I'm stunned, right? And being stunned won't do anything until I actually draw that stun card. But the fact that the game labels me as stunned allows us to introduce a lot of mechanics that play off of that. For example, we can have a weapon that it's like stun sword. If your opponent is stunned, do more damage. Um, so we can encourage players to combine status effects with weapons and items that benefit off of those status effects. Uh, we can also do turn by turn ticking. So for example, like the poison effect in Slay the Spire, where you're taking a certain amount of damage every turn. Uh, that's definitely something that we're going to incorporate. There's poison, burned, frozen, stunned, all sorts of status effects in the game right now. But of course, we'll be looking to add more. And we don't want to create a million of these. We want to kind of reuse the same ones across multiple different classes, just so that the game is a little bit less daunting to learn. But I think this is uh, opens up a good amount of design space, just being able to put like ticking status effects on your opponent constantly. That's going to be a really important thing to do. So a lot of mechanics that we can't do right now that we're looking to implement in the near future are, for example, uh, like Gem Cannon right here. Gem Cannon does not work. This is supposed to be a choose one card, you know, where you have two options to choose from. And it works kind of like, like Druid cards in Hearthstone, right? So adding a gem to your hand, a gem is just a card that cycles. It doesn't do anything else. It makes your deck bigger, but it doesn't dilute it at all. The other ability is deal damage equal to the number of gems you own. So one of the mechanics in Merchant is to make your deck really big. Buy a bunch of cards, add a bunch of gems to your deck that do nothing but make it bulkier. All the gems do is cycle. And certain cards like Gem Cannon would reward you for having a lot of gems, or they would reward you for having a very big uh, pile of cards. And um, the issue right now is that we can't, in the game engine, have a card like Gem Cannon count the number of gems that you have just yet. Uh, we should have that within the next few weeks. There's certain other mechanics that we really want, but we just don't have. For example, return a card from your discard pile to your hand or put a card from your discard pile on top of your deck and put an item that you buy give it quicken right buy the item but it goes straight to the top of your deck rather than to your discard pile when you buy it all these little mechanics are um you know things that we want to incorporate and things that we want to test and really see 
um, you know, if we like the feel of it or uh, if it maybe doesn't make sense. Um, so, yeah, it's all just stuff we're thinking about right now. The pattern that we're in at the moment is basically try new cards, talk about classes and the ways that... Um, so let me just finish this turn. Uh, you know, talk about new classes, new cards, new mechanics, balance. We're basically focused purely on gameplay. We keep introducing new cards to the game. We're testing new classes to the game. We're balancing those classes. And as we're doing that, we keep asking the, the back end and the server developer, hey, I need this mechanic to work. Or, hey, I need to be able to have a card do this kind of thing. And we're constantly adding abilities for cards to do things. So even though the game might look really simple, right, it's like six, six piles, and that's all there really is on the board, a couple monsters on the side, uh, there's going to be a lot of different ways to interact with these, right? You're going to be moving cards between zones, between your deck, your discard pile, putting cards in your opponent's discard pile, your opponent's deck, killing monsters. They're going to give you rewards and do stuff. This beehive, if you poke it, it makes bees attack you. A bunch of bees cover your own stores. Uh, we're going to be able to change the costs on things, upgrade cards. And these are all things that we're thinking about doing, right? One other uh, final big game design decision that I kind of want to talk about and we haven't implemented it yet, but I think it'll be important, is multiplying every number by, like, five, for example. So in our game, like a, a starting jar of trinkets, right, it gives you one money. A starting sword in a deck gives one attack. So if we wanted to do an upgrade effect, like give all of your swords plus one attack, it's really hard to balance it right now because it literally doubles the power level of every sword you have. Now, if instead everybody's health was five times higher and this sword had five attack, suddenly we have a lot more flexibility to give it, you know, uh, plus one attack. It doesn't become twice as good. It just becomes an incremental upgrade. So we're probably going to inflate the numbers. And I mean, we're not going to go like full Yu-Gi-Oh or this costs one trillion gold or anything, but... We will uh, probably beef up the numbers just so that we can introduce those upgrade mechanics and have more flexibility with how they work. So yeah, some small changes, like visually, not too much has changed. Um, one of the last things that we're going to be doing is uh, adding assets and artwork and colorized stuff to the game. We want to make sure that we have the gameplay down very, very far along before we start introducing those things. Uh, that being said, I made a lot of progress on the art front as well, because one of the big things we were missing before is a uh, a lead art director. And, uh, you know, it's just something that's very important for a game. Your game needs to visually stand out. It needs to look different from other games. This is all, keep in mind, this is all placeholder art. This is not where a game is going to look like. And um, I found a phenomenal art director based out of Los Angeles. So um, I'll be excited to kind of show you some of the developments that we get, you know, after he's had a chance to work with the artists a bit. One of the first hires that we're making, oh, by the way, with the art director, I, I think that it'd be really cool uh, to have them do some videos maybe with me or by themselves to kind of talk about the art development process because, you know, I felt like that's what the earlier videos that I did pretty much were. It was like me giving suggestions on like visual and things like that. And I think it would be cool to kind of compare and contrast that from the, the perspective of a professional uh, that specializes in this sort of thing. An interesting art style that we're going towards that, that I think at least for environments is pretty unique and cool is the art director suggested this. Uh, the game is called Mighty Quest for Epic Loot. It's like a mobile game. The environmental art in that game is very, very unique. It's like you, it's like realistic, but it has this unique type of shading. And, um, you know, it doesn't look like a generic western fantasy realistic dota character type of game like you know a lot of the modern like auto chess games look like so i think the game will have a unique art style now that we have so, some good leadership in that position and you know all this placeholder gray art stuff some of it will keep obviously some of it will use a lot of it will use um, but a lot of it's going to get redone and there's going to be more of like a cohesive vision behind the art and the the 3d assets and everything so once we have all of that you guys will be able to um to kind of see the the effects of it. Um, I don't even know if Prime Real Estate works yet. For the rest of the game, I'm supposed to gain one money per turn, so I guess we'll see. Anyway, yeah, so that's kind of the high-level stuff. Um, working on a few small feedback mechanisms that we're introducing. Most of the work is really hard to see because what we've really spent a lot of time doing is building out all of these classes, right? We've introduced hundreds of new cards into the game, uh, unless I sit here and play hours with you guys, it's going to be hard to showcase just how many new cards there are. But we're starting to get a better idea for what kinds of mechanics uh, work well and what don't work well. 
Um, and it's going to be a lot of these like rules that are unique to our game that we're going to have to establish when it comes to card design. So, for example, here's Mollusk Farm. Here's a card that I fucked up on. So I'll show you guys kind of a learning process, right? Mollusk Farm. It's a seven mana item. An item means that it's a permanent card that you add to your deck and you keep replaying. When you play it, you add three gems to your hand. What does a gem do? Well, gems don't do anything. They just cycle. They just draw a card when you play them. But they make your deck bigger. So every time you play Mollusk Farm, it's like you're drawing three cards, plus you're adding three filler cards to your deck that just cycle. For Merchant, it's valuable to increase the size of your deck. You want to get like 60 cards. Maybe you have like Deck Cannon that does damage equal to the number of cards that you own, for example. Anyway, so Mollusk Farm. Why is this bad design? Well, it's too many extra steps. I play Mollusk Farm, and I get an animation that adds three gems to my hand. And then for every single gem, I have to manually play the gem. And when I play the gem, it draws me a card. So I basically have to do four inputs to draw three cards. So what's a better way of doing the same exact card with the same exact result? Well, Mollusk Farm should say, draw three cards, acquire three gems. And it's two sentences, it's a little bit more text, but what's the end result? You just play one card, you draw your three, your three gems get added to your discard pile. You know, 99 times out of 100, it's the same effect, but 100% of the time, it's way faster, way faster. So I keep thinking about like designs like this, right? Um, there's a bunch of other rules we've figured out. You can't put disruptive cards in a recursive effect, meaning that if there's a card that's going to like fuck with your opponent's store and cover it up, or if there's a card that's going to add a curse to your opponent's deck, it can't be an ability on an item that you're going to repeatedly play. Um, it's very toxic gameplay. We basically put all of our effects that mess with the opponent on like one-offs. So meaning like a spell that only affects one time when it's played. Or for example, a um, uh, like a monster that you kill. As a reward, it's going to mess with the opponent somehow. Um, so we're, we're thinking about things more in this way uh, the more that we play. Yeah, so just some rules being established. I think it's overall a good thing. You know, certain mechanics we found out are toxic. We're implementing less of them. Certain mechanics are really fun to play with. We want to implement more. Um, so it's going in the right direction. I think, you know, there's no shortcut to card design. But when I first started, maybe like two, two years ago, I thought, well, hey, I'll just design a fun card and then I'll design the next fun card and the next fun card and I'll just go one by one. And maybe I'll try to like design around archetypes. But the reality is, it's not exactly the best way to make compelling card design because you, you need a lot of trial and error. You need to figure out what mechanics aren't fun, what mechanics are fun. There's no way to do that right out of the gate without playing thousands of games. So um, we're in the process of doing that. I think the card design is getting more fun. The game's getting a little bit better every day, uh, and the progress has been, has been really good. So the only bottleneck right now is just that when we want to introduce a new game mechanic, um, it takes some time before that's implemented in the game engine. And I'm going to solve that problem by, you know, being able to hire more folks in the near future so that, you know, as soon as we have an idea for a card, we'll be able to get that implemented in the game that day or within a couple days. And I hope overall this has been a somewhat interesting video for you guys. I do appreciate you watching. I'd love to be able to show you more visual things because, look, I, I know you haven't played this game. There's a bunch of gray artwork. You don't know what the fuck these rectangles are. Trust me, I appreciate how difficult it is to follow when you just like watch a game board like this. But I'm not trying to explain to you guys what all these cards do, and it's not important if you can follow along to the game right now. What's important is that um, I'm just kind of communicating the, the stuff I'm thinking about, the stuff the team's thinking about uh, when it comes to game design right now. Um, and hopefully that process is kind of interesting because I think, you know, especially once the game is released and you guys have had a chance to play with it, um, especially I've had a chance to play the beta for those of you that have supported the game uh, on the website uh, or in the Indiegogo. After you've had a chance to play with it, I think it'll be interesting for you guys to look back on the video and kind of see how the game came to the point that it's at. And yeah, hopefully it won't be in a funny way of doing that, I guess. Like, I, 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 last thing I want is for this game to become a meme like Artifact. But yeah, here's hoping, you know, no way, no way to know until it's out there. Um, anyway, I do appreciate you guys watching. Thank you for supporting the game. Thank you for all your comments, all your feedback. Um, I've been doing a lot of traveling and just a lot of, a lot of just like business development stuff over the past couple months, just because we're about to take a really big step in the company. We're about to, you know, start hiring a lot of folks and we're about to start making a lot of big initiatives. 
And because of that, you know, I feel like I haven't been as responsive on Reddit or in YouTube comments as I was originally. Uh, but that's definitely something that I want to change. And I'm about to, uh, I trust me, I promise you guys I'm going to answer like at least 20 comments. Please give me some constructive ideas, some constructive feedback, some thoughts, first things that come to mind. Any ideas you guys have for speeding up the game, even like little things. It's a, it's a game of like shaving nanoseconds off, you know. We do that a hundred times, love a very quick game. Any ideas you have, ideas for classes, ideas for card mechanics. I can't wait to get you guys a custom tool uh, that lets you design your own cards to submit. Uh, we actually, it's one of the other big developments we did is we finished our card design tool for the back end. It's not pretty, but it's much, much faster and more convenient to add new cards to the game now. And we're just going to keep improving that with time. And eventually there will be a public version of it. Uh, so you guys can do custom card design. I hope it's been fun. Um, Give me any questions you have too, because you know one of my big challenges before doing an update video these days is uh, trying to figure out like what exactly is it that you want to see? Because there's so many things that go into game design, right? There's like the behind the scenes biz dev stuff. There's like uh, the meetings and the calls. There's like the really abstract game designy idea stuff. There's the brainstorming sessions. There's the, the detail oriented like tweaking small things uh, with the game board or with visuals or with animations. There's the whole art direction side of it. There's like individual card design and card design philosophy. The uh, point is, there's a lot of different things that go into making a game. And I think that all of these things are appealing to listen to to different people. So I would like to hear from you guys what it is you want to see more of. Are you just interested in like visual stuff? You want to see like 3D models and new card art as it progresses? Or are you interested in more of the abstract stuff? Are you interested more in like game design philosophy and mechanics? Do you want to see like individual cards and how that individual card got designed? You know, I, I don't know. Are, are you good with everything? Anyway, give me, give me some ideas for update videos and there shall be more update videos. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one.